like the did you know did you know that? I yeah, I don't I don't know the, much it about that. It's inverted flat slab design. So and it was unanchored to the rock, it was floating. Did you know okay. about that? Uh, I didn't know that at Lakewood, but I know we had that technology from um, of of a floating pad from uh, May Company Fairfax, which is on on the tar pits, that's also on a floating flat slab, so so that it wouldn't sink in into the tar pits. Yeah, but, it's always been incredible to me because it still is pretty stable. Oh yeah, <laughs> that yeah. building. Um, okay, and then was there is it was there truth to the idea that those underground tunnels that they had some like fallout shelters in Lakewood? It, it could be, and one of, the, one of the things about the tunnels at Lakewood was you had this shopping center that was surrounded by cars, and they couldn't understand to, how to service the, the stores, how to get the goods into the stores. So, so what they did was they built a, a ramp at one end, which went down uh, under the stores so the, they could unload the trucks and move the goods up, and that was... Uh, that was a very interesting way to do that, and, but after a while, that was so expensive that uh, as the shopping centers evolved, now they just park the trucks on the outside and send the, the goods in all at the same level. And you can see any shopping center you go to, you can see where those service points are. But at Lakewood, which was maybe the first one, it had the tunnel underneath. So in that period of time, to use that tunnel for bomb shelter would would yeah probably so that's what they would have done yeah yeah cool okay so then the next one is trw and you know you were talking about simon remo and dean woolridge and the thing is my understanding was that they actually did work for howard hughes uh, and then they left the, to start their own company well that that's probably true he, i didn't get that when i this was at a cocktail party where he explained to me the history of the aerospace industry but uh, that sounds right because he said the uh, i think the first airplane that uh, of substance that they designed in santa monica was the dc3 uh, and uh, he said there was just a brilliant series of engineers Talk to me, tell me, start, if you could start out by saying TRW, and um, I guess it's Thompson, Ramo, Woolridge, right. the research and development, but then, you know, if you could, because it seemed like you guys really responded very intelligently to incorporate some of these new technologies, and how many buildings it was, so maybe you could just kind of describe, say the name of the building, and then sure. talk a little bit about, these look like they're similar. Yeah. Well, there was... Uh there were a series of buildings, and, and these are the, the low-rise buildings, and maybe uh, my favorites, and uh, I'm trying to think of, it might have been called One Space Park, or something like that, and it would have been called Space Park because TRW was intimately involved with, with the Man on the Moon mission. Actually, they put the Man on the Moon before they finished the building. It really came out of a series of trailers that were all put together on the uh, Manhattan Beach El Segundo site. But these buildings, I always have thought of them as being fantastic because they respond to the Southern California climate. And you can see that the, um, they have these sunshades. You know, uh, the this, this solar radiation in California has a lot to do with the energy conservation, keeping the sun off the glass. And what they did is they had overhangs, but they suspended this dark glass so you could see th through the glass to the sky but this dark uh, I think it's solar uh, I think they call it solar band uh, I forget what it was gray light 14 but this dark glass uh, let the vision come through but it really shaded the the, uh, the clear glass uh, in the uh, the offices and the laboratories and so on so it was very uh, much a response to our climate um, and very, very clean and, and very modern in that way, campus-like. Um, uh, I think the, the part of that composition here was the, uh, the, the TRW Tower, uh, which was kind of a contrast. You know, if the buildings were very dark, the, this was a white tower made out of precast concrete. Uh, 
Uh, and then, uh, then I think there were two other campuses that were very near that. I think one was called, um, we called it Site X, but uh, there, uh, there was another campus across the way. Right, there was one, a 90-acre lab in Canoga Park, and then 110 acres in El Segundo. Yeah, well, it was El Segundo, Manhattan Beach, uh, because the city lines went through, through that part. Um, and how many buildings were part of the complex? Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know, but 20, 30, you know, at least. Um, built in a very modular way and, and also built, uh, I'm kind of remembering that, that uh, they were very interested in how they would cluster people who would work on a project. So there was a lot of uh, concern about social interaction when they would set up these office modules. Um, it's interesting that this complex, I think, happened after Department of Water and Power in downtown Los Angeles, and they're somewhat related with the overhangs and their thoughts about mechanical systems. Um, and what, the Department of Water and Power, we did a lot of research on mechanical systems working in the Southern, Southern California environment. Uh, things like the weather is so good we didn't need boilers, so uh, Water and Power didn't have any boilers. It would use the heat of the, of the electric lights and the air conditioning and use the fountains to make the water cool and so on. So there's a little of that technology into, up in these aerospace build, buildings. Yeah, and we're going to talk about DWP next. Um, can you speak a little bit, if you can, to like what, how you had to respond to some of their technological requests? Because they have, have these huge rooms for computers and labs and, you know, the computers were the size of rooms at that point. Sure, yeah. Well, the computers were just huge uh, and of course they were tremendous heat generation and uh, so the um, in fact what you would see here is so because we wanted these buildings to be extremely flexible uh, we would design the mechanical systems and the ceiling systems so that you could with a screwdriver you could take a wall down and and move things around and move an air conditioning duct to a computer and so on. So these, these buildings, in a way, were more sophisticated that way than the newer office buildings that we're in now. Uh, now it's all about first cost and so on, but in, in these buildings, they, you could take them apart and, and put them, reconfigure the space, reconfigure the lights, the ceilings and so on in a, in a very predictable way uh, because they knew that their, their uh, research and their computers and so on were going to change uh, over a period of time. And was that something new and innovative at the time? Abs yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it was, um, I think it was, it was in the air, so to speak. There was a, a lot of this conversation in New York City and, uh, and in this aerospace world uh, that uh, if you're really optimistic about the future, you think of the future as always changing, so you would design these office buildings uh, so that you could go in with a screwdriver and, and move things around. In fact, um, if you ever watch that series Madman, if you look at all, they, they did a good job, if you look at all the partitions in Madman, they're all demountable, they're of this generation where everything's modular and you can move things around. And this had that, w that way of thinking. And uh, it created a beautiful aesthetic as, um, of, of panelization and grids with variety in the grids and so on. It seemed as, as really intelligent design that was responding to new technologies. Yeah, I, I think it was a very inventive period of time. And I love the story about Sam uh, Ramo and Woolridge too, yeah. operating out of their garage and they really developed over the years in terms of yeah. contracts I guess with the Department of Army and all yeah. of that. You know there's a there's another little um, um, who's who's your photographer? Uh, Shulman? Shulman. Another Shulman story. Uh, if, if you want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. So um, I 
I think there was one summer when I worked with my grandfather, uh, you know, where our, our generations, you know, crossed, uh, the first and the third. Uh, but he was, he was older then, and, and uh, of course, the grandfather was the person at Christmas and Easter and so on. I never really had any conversation with him. And, there, and after, uh, I think my father died, but Shulman was still alive. So I actually went to Julius and said, so what was my grandfather really like? And so he started telling me about the personality of my grandfather and what he was like, who his friends were and all of that. So I got, I got some information from Julius bef you know, that I couldn't get from uh, my own family. But that was a, that was a lot of fun, and and because you, you remember how sharp Julius was just in, until he passed away, but uh, uh, that was great. Julius worked for my grandfather, and then my father and uncle, and and, and uh, with us as well. Um, there is a house I designed that I asked Julius to photograph, and I was one of those people. He <laughs> he went up to. Um, it was in Beverly Hills and he had a, a saw and he sawed off a branch of a tree from a house next door and he had me holding the tree so it could be the, you know, the, the photographic foreground and, and the building in the background. But, so I had a chance to work with him as well. Yeah, he was great. We spent yeah. a lot of time together. Yeah, yeah. How old were you when your grandfather passed away? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I. Um, I was pretty young. I um, it would be school? be it would be high school. Yeah. yeah, I think in high school before I went to college. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Um, okay, so let's talk about DWP building. So the city contacted your firm and said, you know, we want to build a building that really has a is a landmark for. L.A. Right? Is that the story? Or uh, well, no, it's, the, it's... The development... I of, think... This was a really smart building and so yeah. ahead of its time. I think you... you I think there's a... I don't know how we made the contact, but as I said, there, there would have been three choices, and we were probably the right choice. Pereira would have uh, been doing something different than we would have been doing. Uh, you have to also realize that the... the people that built that building, the engineers from the Water and Power, were probably the same guys that brought water to, you know, that goes back to Mulholland and the guys that engineered the waterways and the water systems for the San Fernando Valley and the Owens Valley and all of that. So these guys were, um, they were pretty interesting uh, people and pretty inventive. They, they had established the infrastructure for Los Angeles uh, that allowed Los Angeles to grow. So very sophisticated and they were very interested in uh, again the future, uh, innovation, uh, but they never said build a, a landmark for the city. They said how can we build a building that shows what we do? And so the idea was to build a building that expressed water and power. And that, uh, so we did tremendous research into, for example, uh, what was the, the ideal um, foot candles in a working environment. So we had ophthalmologists come in and all of this. It ends up we overestimated it by tremendous factor. We figured 300 foot candles would be the ultimate human um, Com, you know, comprehension for the most efficiency and so on. Well, we, we're now looking at 30 and 35 foot candles, so that was, uh, but we did research with ophthalmologists. Again, we had this attitude about uh, the, 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 what the future brings will be changed, so the building was this modular building that could, could be converted to any configuration we could dream up. Uh, but the, 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 it is a smart building, and the, the systems are interesting. First of all, long overhangs uh, to protect it from the sun, and yet had this glorious full floor-to-ceiling glass, you know, very, uh, absolutely clear glass. Um, uh, the climate is so mild here that it didn't need any heating systems. 
but what we used for when it is cold in the morning, if you left the lights on at night, the heat of the light would um, heat, heat up, make sure that the temperature was right when people came to work. Well, it just so happened that this was located at the termination of all the freeways, and it became this incredible lantern all lit up at night. It became a beacon from which the freeways would, would drive in and, and, and see all of that. And um, uh, it, it, it was glorious, middle of the night, this building is, is like that, uh, until 1971 when we had the first oil crisis. And then that, that idea of a, a building being lit up, lit up at night was, uh, was considered wasteful. And, and they were subject to tremendous criticism and had to change the system. Uh, the, the other side of that also the, it was the Department of Water and Power. The water, instead of having these cooling towers, as you see with the plumes coming up, uh, the fountains, the, the whole building surrounded by a lake, and the fountains became the cooling system for the, uh, for the air conditioning system. Uh, and so in a way it became a, what we would call now a high performance building where all of the systems, the structure, the mechanical, the electrical, were all integrated to, to work off of one another. Uh, it's an idea that we're getting back to now uh, uh, in a big way because of sustainability and, and, and uh, get using the absolute minimum amount of energy. The, these people were not interested in the minimum amount of energy. They were interested in being smart. Um, and, but, but also reflecting what they did. And was it thought to be a um, bookend for the Civic Center? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I remember, uh, uh, I remember uh, when Dad introduced me one night after the, uh, the opera to Buffy Chandler, uh, there was always competition between this building and the Music Center because she knew darn well it was gonna block the view of her building from the freeway. And she said, how can you make a building that's transparent, you know? Well, th this building is an acre big, but I, I sometimes I think, well, one way would be to just have these kind of horizontal plates with the clear glass and so on. But, but I remember meeting her after the, uh, the opera one night, and she, she says, Al, when are you going to turn off those damn lights? They're too bright, you know, and, which was the whole lantern idea and so on. But uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was perceived as the end of the, um, uh, the termination of the, of the center. And uh, every time somebody proposes to put a, a new building in the middle of the mall, I, I, I wonder about that. Yeah. Um, okay, so tell me what this building is and yeah. give me a little bit of history. Sure. Well, this, this is uh, St. Basil's, and uh, uh, again, this came out of our uh, association with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And uh, they came to us, and it might have been uh, uh, Archbishop McIntyre? I don't know if I, ha I have that right. I think that that's right. And he wanted a church that was, uh, had a, a historic connection with St. Paul's outside the wall in Rome. And, um, uh, and that would say it would be uh, historic references and so on. And, and uh, I remember once my father and I were in Rome and I got him on the back of a motor scooter, and the two of us went out to see St. Paul's outside the room. It was a fabulous event, because he'd never been there. I'd never been there. And, uh, I couldn't believe he'd get on the back of a motor scooter in Rome. But <laughs> we went out to see St. Paul's. But the, uh, they were able to, I think with tremendous skill, get the, um, the uh, uh, Archbishop very excited about a building that made references to an early Christian church and its simplicity and its sense of verticality. And I think the lighting on the inside of St. Basil's as well. Um, the, uh, uh, there, I think there is an abstract relationship to an early Christian church that's, that's very real. 
uh, uh, the early Christian, I think St. Paul's outside the wall had these great alabaster windows and uh, uh, dad got Claire Falkenstein, the artist involved, and she made these great glassy, uh, incredible uh, Cortin steel and glass um, um, uh, vertical windows that fit between these kind of crags of, of concrete. Uh, most beautiful uh, 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 composition. The, the acoustics are interesting too because the acoustics are very much early Christian uh, or uh, with these long reverberation times. And if you go over there and talk to the, the people in charge of the, of, of the music, the they, uh, Gregorian chants and this early music uh, sounds incredible in there. And of course, with this long delay, contemporary music doesn't. But uh, um, and so there was a lot of artists involved, and uh, uh, it was a, really a fabulous exercise. I was in the office when that was underway, and in fact uh, had uh, the task of building models of that building for the, the guy, a man named Bozadar von Serda, who was the assigned designer to the job. And that's a hard building to make models of. <laughs> um, wasn't your wasn't your family's firm involved early on in a building that was also St. Basil's in the 20s on this site, and then it was uh, moved? So uh, I wasn't clear what the history was. Yeah, I think on that site, uh, there w the early St. Basil's was a wooden church that burned down. Our family home was at Catalina in Wilshire, right by the, the hotel there. And I think that St. Basil's uh, was where, where uh, everybody went to church. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I'm not sure whether we designed the original St. Basil. It's just not sure. I'm not sure of that. Yeah. I mean, I read um, that, that you did, and then actually then the building was moved um, from one location to another, you, and that was in the 20s that, and the 30s. That, that, that could be, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now next is the Arco Tower. So tell me what the full title, it's Atlantic Richfield Plaza, and just describe this. Sure. The, um, uh, yeah, what, I, what I'm, I'm trying to think, what is, what is the date of that? Is it 63, 64? No, I think it's um, 72. 72. So we would have started working on it in 65, 66. I remember studies, Dad would bring home studies of a, a big, huge tower or two towers or low buildings, tall buildings. And the, the scheme came out of a, a partnership between uh, the oil company, which was uh, Richfield Oil, which was a, a California Signal Hill oil company. They uh, combined with uh, Atlantic Oil Company. Uh, so it was Atlantic Richfield Oil. Uh, and uh, the, uh, with a, uh, Robert O. Anderson being the executive coming from, coming from uh, the East Coast. Very uh, marvelous, interesting man. Uh, so that's the Atlantic Richfield. But the other partner in the deal was Bank of America. And I think the name was Cleve Bonner, could be. And we had been working for Richfield Oil and helping them in a number of tasks that had to do with the, rich, the old Art Deco Richfield oil uh, remodeling and, and, and so on that was on that site, a kind of a marvelous old black and gold Deco building. Um, but uh, the, this notion of creating a brand new center was just an amazing uh, pro uh, process, very large, large project. And there was all, always this kind of how do you deal with the image of Bank of America and uh, Atlantic Richfield? And um, Bank of America wanted a white building, and Bank uh, uh, Richfield Oil, they wanted a black building. And uh, uh, Robert O. Anderson uh, had as a personal advisor a uh, Bauhaus artist, uh, Herbert Beyer. And, um, uh, and Herbert Beyer was involved with everything that uh, uh, Atlantic Richfield did, to the picking the sign colors of the gas station to these towers. And uh, so the, it's a very 
a modernist building, something that we were uh, very versed in, but it has a Bauhaus uh, reference uh, to it uh, in, a, in a very classic way, a beautiful building. Uh, the compromise between a white building and a black building turned, was dark green. Uh, but I think Robert O. Anderson clearly had something in mind. And, but the, the white-black, uh, I think the, finally the decision was made when they all went to Europe to look at stones uh, one late night drinking a lot of wine. Dark green was the, is what it came down. We had designed a lot of the building before the final color was uh, selected. But, uh, and of course, that's Herbert Byers' uh, sculpture in the, in the middle of the plaza. And can you talk about the windows? Because weren't the windows unusually large? Well, the, the windows were seven feet by seven feet, but very beautifully proportioned. And the windows were proportioned um, totally relating to the structural system. The columns were 15 feet on center. Uh, the windows were about 40% of the exterior wall, so 40% of it was glass, the 60% was, was, uh, was granite. And that was uh, large for its time. Uh, uh, and uh, whether there, uh, I don't know about the size so much, but when you're in that building, you really feel the beauty of the proportions of, of, that, of those windows. It's, it's a very special, uh, gives you a very nice feel exterior and interior. And I read somewhere that the entrance had to be on flower instead of Figueroa because the, after you did a search for the elevation, it was found that... Uh, right. So maybe you can touch... Well, it, it, no, I, I think it was because it was could have been on Figueroa, could have been on flower. Well, you start again that the entrance was oh, on to the, so... The, 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 the issue is uh, where, where should the front door be, these two twin towers? Uh, and it could have been on the level of Figueroa, which is about one floor above the level of flower. So the site is sloping. And we could have made the plaza up, or we could have put it down on flower. And the decision to put it on flower was because all of the banks were lined up on Flower Street. And, that's what, and so I think Bank of America um, kind of uh, prevailed on on that decision, um, and of course the banks are all long gone and and so on. But I think it, I think it was a good choice. Uh, you couldn't have the the you know on, on flower, and um, couldn't have had it on both. So that was the decision. And then where um, the plaza meets the the grade, there's this beautifully rough hewn granite that creates this. A beautiful wall that kind of sets the plaza uh, uh, onto a, uh, uh, this plinth that's so classic. And did you have to dig unusually deep to set the foundation for this one? Um, I think I don't. I don't think so. It's it is a very deep basement, about ninety feet down, but it's it is a flat slab, a th very thick mat foundation. It doesn't it doesn't have piles that go down. The, the land is, is, uh, is, is, in downtown Los Angeles, is, is very good that way. We don't have to go way down to bedrock. Uh, so it's mat foundations, but when they dug down, they found old rivers and streams that were going through the property, and they had to uh, uh, de have a, a continual dewatering system for, for that. Uh, Do you think this building has like a California aesthetic to it? No, it's, no, it's it's a uh, uh, what would you what would you call it an international style? That's what the Bauhaus people would, would call it. Yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, definitely it's an international style. Whereas Water and Power and TRW would be very much California. Yeah. All right, I think um, I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, I guess I just have one last question that I don't think we really touched on at the beginning, and it was really kind of this development of an identity for a corporation and kind of the idea of corporate modernism and really how your father was really was around at that time where you know cr almost creating an image for a corporation is that is that fair or was it was it not that 
planned out? Well, f for uh, Atlantic Richfield, it was very much a, an image for a, a, an international style image uh, that reflected, you know, not only the work that we've done, but it reflected Herbert Meyer and his aesthetic uh, coming from the Bauhaus and that. So I think in, in that regard, uh, that was quite con contemplated. Uh, Water and Power and TRW were really more organic, really kind of, we did things in a modernist way because of this optimism about the future, uh, the, uh, strategies that came out of adapting the buildings to the climate. The, the other influence that, that I think is very real is all of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the work of the case study architects. Uh, the 4950 Charles Eames and that whole generation of architects, Ooh, they were doing the same thing, and uh, there was an there was an influence that we would have from their work, and sometimes maybe the other way around. But this idea of, of simple overhangs, big sheets of glass, adapting to the climate, uh, uh, kind of minimal use of materials. So there, there would be that influence as well. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, uh, they influence. I th I, there was an influence coming out of California that really s spread around the country and around the world, actually. Yeah. You know, the other thing I haven't said, and, and I realize there's a cutoff period, but so the, it went from my, uh, my father uh, to my, uh, excuse me, my grandfather, my father, and my uncle, and now it's my cousin and I, so uh, our relationship is interesting. Chris Martin is the, uh, the managing partner, and I'm the design partner, and it works very well that way. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess we've survived, I, I think, because of a, a, a culture and an ethic that was started a long time ago. And we're thrilled to be able to keep it going. Did you think when you were younger, did you want to be involved in the business? Um, I was a product of uh, uh, probably my mother more than anything else. If, if I needed a piece of paper and a pencil or a camera, I had it. it was <laughs> and I loved it. I, I really was encouraged to do to uh, to draw and photograph and travel and all of that and I just I just really enjoyed it uh, uh, there was a bit of uh, rebellion not much but I really wanted to be an automobile designer at one period of time I mean my gosh growing up in Southern California uh, and and at one time actually took a, a you know a class or two over at Art Center on Third Street uh, but realize pretty quickly that it's design is design, and probably architecture has a little richer, uh, uh, you know, series of uh, a, a richer vocabulary than just industrial design. Yeah. Um, we saw some of your watercolors, and they're really oh. <laughs> they're really beautiful, though. I mean, they just have this sense of line and color, which is fantastic. But also the amount of information. Oh, well, thank it, you. It yeah. portrays of a building. It yeah. kind of gives almost a nuance and an atmospheric feeling. Yeah. So, Well, yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I, I love to draw. And, of course, when I teach, all of these kids are grown up on, with the computer. I, uh, I think I'm part of a group that is trying to force the kids back to drawing and to be able to use the computer but be able to express themselves with their... Uh, in a fundamental way. Yeah. Also, that connection between the hand and the brain. Yeah, right, right. That, that there shouldn't be any intermediaries yeah. and Well, it's, and, and it's very real, and I suppose you could do it with a, key, a keyboard, but uh, um, I, I think part of any art expression, uh, being able to draw is pretty important. What, this is just an aside, but what when you travel, like, is there a part of the world that gives you a lot of inspiration in your that, that you bring back and that? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, um, 
uh, a life experiences. When I when I left uh, Columbia Graduate School, I was fortunate to have a traveling fellowship. So I spent three four months traveling around the world uh, and really visiting public spaces, visiting uh, in pretty exotic places in the world, but uh, some of which are, no longer exist. But uh, but. Uh, when I travel, I just love to see how towns are organized and how the public spaces are utilized. And, I, and that's, that's informed me all my life, to try to make interesting places that aren't just architecture, but are a, a larger social involvement. It's always interesting to see, like, Italian piazzas. Well, you really love them, you know. <laughs> just the whole world circulates through those in such an yeah. efficient... So we, we constantly ask ourselves, how do you do that in a contemporary way? In fact, uh, just the project we're working on here, it's, it's a big part of it. How do we uh, make this a place for people in the city? That, um, and there's very few really great American examples. Rockefeller Center, of course, is the one that is one of the most interesting. But since we were always an automobile culture, uh, we never got to... Uh, a place where you could really uh, develop sophisticated environments around a pedestrian activity. Europe was the other way around. That's where they started. But now we're trying to get back to that. Yeah, it's funny because I think in LA there's still not that many places. You know, you have these really pseudo, like man-made, whatever, Universal City Walk and yeah. LA Live. But yeah. I don't think. I just feel like those are way too contrived. Yeah. But real areas where people do yeah. their day-to-day. -day. It's a lot of study in, the, in this, and we, we're uh, kind of students of a number of, uh, of people who, uh, we, I, could, I could give you the rules of how a space works and how it doesn't. You know, it's sun and shade, a place to sit down, line it with, uh, uh, with, with shops and very uh, transparent uh, storefronts and all of that. So what, where in L.A. is that realized? Well, it's realized? Al always the next project we're working on. But <laughs> where, where in L.A. now? Do I don't. Do you think it's a successful public plaza yeah, environment? I, I, you know, none as good as they could be. I don't know if you noticed the one downstairs, but we, we went back and redid that uh, plaza and, and, and absolutely livened it up. But it's still... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not as good as it could be, but it's, it's a very fine example of how do you take uh, a space that was designed to be rather sterile and, and, and so on in the beginning, and how do you make it more for the people that live in the building. So that's, a, I think, a pretty good example of what we can do. And take a look at it on the way out. Yeah, no, it's very pleasant. Yeah. I got here early and people were sitting around yeah. and felt very convivial and open, and there was some covered and some open. And you know, I don't know if this is this would be a fit in your history, but there is an interesting point, and Arco Plaza is a good example of maybe what not to do from a from a, 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 a human scale and so on. But when uh, uh, when in the fifties they would design these environments, their attitude was much different than you and I might have in this period of time. They felt that. Um, it was all about the corporation and how impressive the corporation should be and you shouldn't have any little food stands or places to sit out on the plaza because it would ruin the line of it. You know, these buildings look beautiful because of a simple plane and then these, these kind of minimalist structures in, coming out of it. And you wouldn't want to clutter things up and all of that. Uh, they wanted things to be severe and simple. And, and uh, I remember discussions with my father, he, who, who always had his, he had the office on 2nd Street or 3rd Street or Broadway at different times. And he says, you know, uh, the streets, the sidewalks were always too full of people and all the, the overhangs, you know, and the garbage and it smelled. He said, we want it clean now. Of course, now we're trying to have it clean, but get back to that rich texture of neighborhoods. Uh, That's interesting. But, but, uh, but the, in the 50s, they, 
they, they weren't interested in street life. They were, you know, they were uh, uh, ambiance wasn't, you know, and, and having people feel good in the city and all that. Just that's not what's on their mind. They wanted to create a beauty that was minimal and severe, and, and they did it. Um, you know, now it's it, it's different. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I think yeah. Covered, I think yeah. you covered everything. Yeah. No, that okay. was great. Okay. Great. Thanks for taking yeah. the time. I know you had a lot going on today. We'll get you, Prince. While we'll uh, yeah disengage you. Okay.